And good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Gavin Davis podcast featuring my good friend Dave Bruff. So this is the first one that we're going to run with. This is uh, season one, episode one. We're going to run with this. We're going to bring you so much detail on these podcasts. We've been really prepping it, really looking forward to it. We're going to be covering a lot of stuff. We're going to be covering everything Budo. So everything that we look at in martial arts. So from our jiu-jitsu, our Brazilian jiu-jitsu, we're going to be looking at MMA. We're going to be having guests on in all these areas as well, who are high high level in these areas. We're going to be looking at the history of jiu-jitsu, um, which is uh, more Dave's forte. Dave, you know, Dave's going to expand massively on that. We're going to be having nutritionists on. We're going to be having... Uh, uh, personal trainers on high level personal trainers who can look at how as we get older and we train we can look at the longevity in our training so that by the time you're 40 and that you're broken you can still train and develop and keep working towards a goal we're going to be looking at all this um we're going to first of all we're going to talk about my background and dave's background so what i'm going to do first of all i'm going to introduce you to dave bruff um, he's going to tell you about his background and then we'll come back to myself and then we'll go through my background a little bit before we move on with the podcast. So Dave, over to you, please, mate. Thanks, Gav. Uh, great to be on. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I'll just start at the beginning. So as a kid, did a bit of judo, uh, not, not for very long, um, but did, uh, actually medal in a competition, still got the medal. So I, I, I that was my first introduction. But I really got started in martial arts when I was 14 years old and I started Shotokan Karate. Okay. And I did that. Um, I graded to first Q brown belt with a Japanese guy called Sadashiki Kato who came to the club to do the gradings. He was a seventh dan at the time. And when he died, he was actually a ninth dan. Very highly respected karateka. Hmm. Um, I switched clubs and the dan grading, I graded to first dan with a guy called Dave Hazard who's a very highly respected karate expert. And uh, he was seventh dan at the time. So that was great. And then I was 18 when I da got the dan grade. And then I went to university and I just did karate at the, the, the karate club. So the various universities I went to for undergraduate and postgraduate. And I was looking to do something different. Um, I was finding karate a bit hard in my joints. And uh, I found this jiu-jitsu club. Okay. Um, uh, a jiu-jitsu club run by us, uh, a great guy called Andy Smith. And uh, it was more kind of traditional British type jiu-jitsu within the British Jiu-Jitsu Association. And I stayed with Andy for ages. Uh, graded up to third down with Andy. Yeah. And uh, then me and my friend Phil Malkin set up our own club. Yeah. And I'd got very interested in the origins of jiu-jitsu in the UK during this time. Uh, yeah. And I started to study this, do a bit of research. And uh, a lot of the research I did uh, as an academic, um, I, you know, I'm a, I am a researcher, trained researcher. Yeah. So I got very into this. And a lot of research I did ended up contributing to a book by Simon Keegan on the history of jiu-jitsu in the UK, um, which yeah. is available. It's a very good book. Um, and I also wrote a couple of articles, academic articles on the origins of jiu-jitsu in the UK, which I guess we'll come across and we'll talk about during, throughout the series. Um, and trying to study the origins of British jiu-jitsu, I ended up looking at the techniques, the history of the actual techniques and throws. Yeah. And it became apparent to me that actually a lot of them are, are based in judo and practiced in Randori. So that's when I, I took up judo. So I've been doing that for a couple of years. So you kind of gone um, full circle there. Gone full circle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And okay. um, uh, yeah, blue belt and judo now. And also, if you look at uh, jiu-jitsu, the early jiu-jitsu that came to the West, to the UK, and also to Brazil, a lot of it was ground techniques. And, um, you know, of course, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is the place where where this has really been optimized. And so I've also been learning Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with yourself. Yeah. Uh, two stripes on my white belt, which I'm very pleased about. Uh, and so that's really where I'm at, Gav. Okay. So I got a couple of questions just off that. Mm -hmm. 
first of all, when you started your karate, where where in the country were you as a, as a child learning your karate? That was in Inverness, Inverness north of Scotland. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then you moved down to the Manchester area when you went to uni, yeah? That's right. So my postgraduate yeah. degree was in yeah. Manchester. Yeah. Now, you said you were struggling with your joints doing your karate. How old were you roughly then? Um, 30, early 30s. Okay. I think what, what I... <laughs> I was the hard floors so that you, you do it on a you, you don't do it on a matted area and i think i was just my knees were beginning to feel a bit of pain but also the clubs i was at i was doing a lot of punching and kicking against nothing it was just in thin air and i don't know if i was maybe just pushing a little bit too much force against my joints mm. um whereas if you're hitting a pad or a bag you have that resistance there that maybe stops you overextending so I, you know, it could have been a technical thing for my yeah. part. I had to adjust, but yeah, I just it was it was beginning to become a bit painful, and I just was looking for something else to develop. Yeah, I've seen demos online of people doing jujitsu and pardon me, jujitsu and judo demos where they're getting thrown on like a wooden floor with no mats, yeah. and they're trying to promote the breakfall. And I understand that, but I think for longevity wise, I don't think it's a great thing to do. No, definitely you know, not. I, I see definitely a lot of not. my friends and a lot of people that I know that their hips, the hips aren't in a good place from old school jujitsu and judo training. Um, I think from everywhere I train now, I think we've we've gone past that. It's it's you know more from from a sort of sports science point of view. We're we're more technical. We're more advanced now with our training methods, which we'll talk about on another podcast later in the series. Um, but. So what? So when you actually started the traditional jujitsu with Andy, when you started getting thrown, how did you feel that on your body? Did that? Did, obviously, there's a conditioning element to that. Did you really struggle with that the first couple of months coming from karate where you didn't get thrown? Very much so. Actually, it took me a while to get used to that, and I think so coming from karate as well, I had a very deep stance, and Shotokan karate is, is typified by having a very deep stance. And if someone's in a very deep stance, they're very, very difficult to throw. Yeah. So I was very awkward to throw, which consequently made my landings a little bit more awkward and difficult to take. Um, and it, it was just gradually an evolution. I learned that yeah, this is going to hurt less if I stand up and go with it more. So you, so the type of jiu-jitsu we were doing, you were completely compliant in the throw yeah. um, as an yeah. uki. So you, you, you end up being able to take it. Something I... Well, in terms of longevity as well, so in, in judo, for example, when you're throwing, you're, the, the tori, the person doing the throw, has to have complete control of the uki. So they keep hold of them. Yeah. So as you throw, the, the, you, you're under control. Whereas in jiu-jitsu, when you're being thrown off a, the, the various techniques, the, the tori just lets go of you, typically. And the landings are a bit harder. So I think... That style of jiu-jitsu probably isn't great for longevity, or you have to, mo you know, you have to be careful. Yeah, which is an interesting point because that brings me on to like with, with my background. Background: I started at five uh, in nineteen ninety at Plasma Leisure Centre doing uh, traditional jiu-jitsu, uh, first with Paul Gage and then with uh, Andy Price, and a few of my I, I, when I went on holiday in two thousand and seventeen, one of my friends said to me, he was like you've been training for nearly 30 years now. How are you not broken? And I think it's because it's because I've always tapped when, when, when stuff's been on my joints, I'll, if, if stuff's on my neck, like a choke, I'll, I'll try and grin and bear it. But when something's extended, I'll, I'll, I will tap, especially in training when there's no medals or no titles to be won. It's just really not worth the ego thing. But I think because I stopped the traditional jiu-jitsu when I was roughly 21 and I didn't have that impact on my hips as I was getting older, I think that helped me because my hips, my back, like touch wood, like I'm 38 now, it all seems fine. But I see people who have gone through that stage through their 20s and their 30s who quickly deteriorate because it's all right bouncing when you're a child, but when when you start getting older, you put a bit of weight on, you get a few niggles and then you want to go training on a Tuesday night and then you're getting slammed. It's like, that's heavy on the body. And for me, I'm like you, I want longevity in training. So I went through 
my teen years doing all my traditional jiu-jitsu, which I really enjoyed, really had some great times with that, went a lot of good, cool places. Um, and then I started cross-training in my late teens. Um, reason being, Andy Price went out to Australia, and we had a chap called Andy Owen take over the club with a lad called Richard Lawrence and Merv. So the three of them would, like, do a little bit of the class each. And Andy Owen was really into, like, the UFC and the cross-training and that. So I started doing a lot with him, with with that aspect of the training. I'd want to put some gloves on and have a go on the ground. And then I realised at a young age that the only advantage I had with the bigger guys at the club who were carrying a little bit of weight, who really didn't have the fitness maybe, was my speed and fitness. And if I had the ability to get them on the ground and be able to work something... So then I started really falling in, in love with the groundwork. And um, then I started cross-training even more. I started wrestling, doing a bit of wrestling. Um, I started going to Russ Williams, do a bit of kickboxing, stand-up stuff. I found that really difficult to start. Really difficult. Um, just the ranges from the stance. So when we, when we have a stance in traditional jiu-jitsu, get your left foot forward, you get your fighting stance. But then when you're actually live sparring with someone who's a trained kickboxer or a tie boxer and they ch start chopping your leg and then you've got to move laterally to, to get away from that strike, that's really difficult to comprehend because you want to block and you want to grab the arm and then you want to come in to, to get a control point for what you've been trained in. But then they come in, they're just something simple like a jab. Just stay stay on the outside and jab you. And I found I found that for months really difficult. And then I'd be I'd be coming home and my legs would be battered, absolutely battered, you know, to the fact that some days I could str str struggle to walk. Um but I've re once I got the the basics of the techniques off Russ with the leg kicks, I started really enjoying the Thai boxing. And then Obviously, I was competing MMA then. I was competing at a semi... I started at amateur level then. I went semi-pro level during this period, around 2007, 2008. And then I eventually went on to a pro level. Uh, I only fought four times at pro. Um, there's there's lads in the Wrexham area like Ian Williams and Aaron Abu who, who've done a lot more pro fights than me. And to be fair, at a higher level. Um, so, some of my opponents were really good. One or two of them were very journeymanish. So I was a little bit disappointed looking back now that I haven't had more pro MMA fights. I would have loved to have had 15, 20 pro MMA fights against good top caliber lads. And then, you know, j just, just for my own, like, um, just for my own mindset, you know, to, to know that I did it at a, a very high level in Europe. Yeah. Can I, can I just yeah. ask you? Uh, yeah. So at this point was, was Andy Price still in Australia? Was it? No, no, he came back in two. So Andy Price came back around two thousand and one. So it was the late nineties for about three years. I was, I started. I was probably about thirteen, fourteen. I started like getting really involved with it. Um, okay. I wasn't competing at that age by any stretch. But then when Andy Price came back, two thousand and one, I was still. I I picked my cross training up quite a bit because then I was coming of age. I was about. 17 and then Andy Price came back to the club and and we Andy had a successful club for a good number of years there we, you know I was there I was up in Rithin teaching for him on a Wednesday night but I was also at the time studying the boxing looking at the Thai boxing and the wrestling and different stuff as well and did, did the cross training influence then how you approached the traditional did it change anything your mindset or how you mm, good you question know? not at that age not at that age because we were still when, when I was doing traditional we were still very syllabus based so we would come in we'd have a we'd have a warm up we'd go through the syllabus and we would practically stick to that the last maybe 5 10 minutes it, we we do a little bit of ground maybe um my mindset today is totally different than my mindset 10 years ago and then my mindset 20 years ago from from train from everything, so yeah, it di didn't really didn't really change it at that time. So 
really, really enjoyed all of my MMA days. And then when I joined the RAF in 2015, before that, I was at Elite for three years, uh, doing MMA there. And I was doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu there with Mick Broster, who's Eddie Bravo's first Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt in the UK. So we had a, a lot of good lads there. Mick used to come down on the Thursday night, really enjoyed his sessions. I learned a lot there. And then I had two... Well, I still have got two very good mates called Daryl and Steve. I don't see much of them now because Daryl's in Japan living living his best life. And Steve's still in Newtown. Um, but I trained with them for a good couple of years. And me and Steve, <clears throat> Steve was very, very good. He's probably, for me, the best under 60 kilo grappler in the in the country if not one or two to you know top one or top two he's excellent i was a little bit heavier i was about 62 63 at the time but i could cut that weight down to his weight under under 60 and then what we did we brought daryl on massively we 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 got daryl training properly at elite we'd have morning sessions we'd have evening sessions and daryl went from um like day one jiu-jitsu to like within three years he was he was ripping everyone's leg off um so yeah me me and steve and daryl worked really well together and i was with them till i joined the raf in 2015 and then since then i've just solely been concentrating on my bjj when you when you joined the raf what level was your bjj i mean has um, so i know you've been doing it for the last <clears throat> yeah. last while but for, yeah did you have a lot of development before that I had a lot of development, but Mick never gave us belts, right? And I think it was because at the time he was like a purple belt off Eddie Bravo. So I think because we didn't really follow the 10th planet system with, because because when you look at the 10th planet system, they, they do a lot of flow, flow drills and that to start and entries into stuff. It's all good stuff. It's all excellent. Um, but you need to know the names of it all and you need to you, you need to um do their system to to really like develop if that kind of makes sense you need to you need to um it's it's hard to say it really um yeah you need to you need to be doing their soul warm-up drills to to start progressing through their grades we didn't really do that. What we did, Mick would come up on a Thursday, we would do a warm-up, and then literally Mick would teach us a technique or two, and then we would go from there. And then when Mick would go away for the rest of the week, we would be working off, off what Mick had shown us with that technique, for example. Um, and we were all in the same boat with that. So we didn't get a grade off Mick. Daryl later did. No, Steve did as well. Steve got, I think Steve got a blue belt in... I don't know. I've top my head. I'd have to ask him, but it was it was years. He was well overdue a blue belt. Do you know what I mean? You, like the, the you know the lads brown black belt level. Simple in in my eyes anyway. Definitely without shadow of a doubt. Daryl's now a brown belt, and you got to remember Daryl started training. Well, fifteen years after me. Um, but a lot of that fifteen years was MMA based, and it was traditional jiu-jitsu based. So Daryl, when he came on the scene in like 2011, when he was with me and Steve, he got like fast track massively because the 10 years where we were like playing with stuff, for example, or oh, does this work? Does this work? We didn't really have the leadership and the coaching in that respect. When Daryl come in, me and Steve would be like, right, we're going to work on this. And so so Daryl like di didn't have to like find his own way, if if that makes sense. He was able to just have someone in me or Steve and Mick who was like, yeah, this is what we're going to work on. And that'll just work on that. And he get good on, for example, leg locks. He got really good, really quick. So, but they were well overdue. So when I joined the RAF to answer your question, um, I joined up and I started a blue belt. And was I a blue belt? People will say yes, people will say no. At the end of the day, the reason I started the blue belt was because I knew that one day I get my purple belt and one day I get my brown belt and one day I get my black belt. 
And when I do get them grades, no one can ever take away take them away from me because I would have got them off the off Kev Capel, off Kostantinos, off Mick, off people like that who are legitimately some of the best in the country, if not Europe, if not the world. And I was with Kev on Thursday. The man's not only an amazing human being, but he's an excellent map man. Same with the relationship I have with Kostantinos. So I'm quite happy learning and developing and getting my belts as and when. And when I do get them off them, no one could ever take them away from me. So going back to yourself, you're doing a lot of the judo now. You're a blue belt, you said, in judo. How do you feel your judo links into the jiu-jitsu? Well, it's yeah, it's interesting. I, I went to judo thinking, having done the jiu-jitsu, I'm going to be pretty good at this. Yeah. But actually... Of course, the judo practice is all randori, or a big emphasis is on randori. So it's throwing, moving, and resisting opponents, um, and it's really tough. You know, it's really difficult. That, in my opinion, and I'm not a judo expert, or you know, I'm, I've got, or I appreciate, I've got a huge amount to learn. And of course, being being the age I am, it's not easy to to have you don't have the same explosive energy that you have as a as a 20 year old for example yeah. so getting in for throws is is a little bit more difficult but in my opinion the skill level required to throw somebody in randori is higher than the skill level required for demonstration purposes you know you yeah. there's so many you just have to have a feel for how your opponent's moving and when the point at which their balance is broken and you can throw them with a particular throw. So the, the, you, you have to have a, a feel, an intuition about when things can work. Yeah. And, and I think that takes, that takes a long time to develop, but I'm still, I'm not quite there yet. I'm still trying to get there. But I think where a lot of the judo, because I spoke to Jeff more about this and uh, say Jeff is a good friend of mine and everything. And um, Jeff used to say a lot of them would only have two or three good techniques that yeah. they were really, really good at. They wouldn't they wouldn't have a thousand techniques. They'd just have one or two that they were excellent at, and they'd have two, two or three backups for that. Yeah, and this is uh, this is definitely the case. You know, the, the good players, they have a couple of techniques. Um, uh, you know, a technique either direction, a forward or backward technique, or, or off to the side, and they just drill them. And I think everybody's different right everybody's different shape different size different kind of physical attributes so everyone develops their own kind of favorite technique and then just uses those and i, I think the top judo players generally will go to one or two techniques and just try and set them up yeah and and do those and i think it's probably the same graph in bjj right you have a you drill you drill your yeah. favorite tech yeah a lot of people get very overloaded overloaded with uh, game plans in BJJ and MMA. Um, I've gone a little bit away from that to a certain degree. I just concentrate on what I know I'm good at. Um, if you start overthinking things, you can... I've seen lads lose fights and confuse themselves just by overthinking everything. It's like, no, just get the takedown. Work your main one or two takedowns split the guard slow everything down get your grips right pass the guard and go from there if he offers you a kimura grip take the kimura grip if he offers you a head and arm triangle take it you don't you don't need to be um thinking about that 10 minutes before you go on and getting your uh, anxiety all worked up because i've i've seen it i've seen lads go pale before they go on the mats and, and especially in mma terrible in mma but I just I just concentrate on what I'm doing and I don't overload with my thinking. I'm just like, right, if I'm in that position, I'll react on it there and then. But that but that's me. I, I would say I'm fairly experienced in competing now. Uh, everyone will have um I, I'll we're gonna get Aaron Aby on the podcast, uh good mate of mine. Uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about Aaron on today, but I'm gonna make a note of 
speaking to Aaron Aby about game plans because when we were younger, when we were training together, he would also always go on about game plan, game plan, game plan. And I need to ask him some questions on game plan. So we'll cover that when we get Aaron Aby on the podcast because I've already touched base with Aaron. And uh, we'll, we'll, that'll be one of the questions going going towards Aaron. Okay. Uh, I was regards, going to say, yeah, go on. Sorry, sorry mate. Go on. Uh, just regards your question to me about the judo, I think yeah. you know, we can get some good judo players on here that will be able to answer that better, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So but we'll you know that. what you were saying about the explosiveness, right? Like, I'm 38 now. I've, I've noticed my... Ex- uh, the speed's still there to a certain degree, but I've noticed my explosiveness is, is starting to dwindle a little bit. I was training down in South Morton Tuesday night before I went away with the raft team. And there's this lad. He's a PTI on camp here, Alex. He's only a blue belt. He's a brown belt in judo. He's about 85 kilo, but there is not an ounce of fat on him. He is shredded. And anyway, he actually took me down with like a judo trip. But I I wasn't too bothered about that because what I tried to do is that if I can't pull a guard and I know I'm going to lose the initial takedown, uh, I'll try and win the, the next best position. So I was able to um, regain a guard and everything. First two, three minutes, you could feel his power. You could feel his strength. Towards the last minute of the match, got the sweep, got on top past his guard, and literally, mate, I was on side control, and it was like a bomb going off under me, right? He exploded and just created a scramble, and he, he was able to just get back to his feet from side control. He had that much explosive power in him, still four minutes in, Escaped the position. Anyway, we went back to it. We had about 30 seconds, 45 seconds left of the round. Back to it. I pulled a guard, worked worked what I was trying to work. And at the end, I was like, Pfft. do you know what I mean? He's only 21, right? He ain't going to be doing that in 20 years. He ain't no. going to be expl- it Literally, Dave, it was like a bomb going off underneath me. I must have raised up about three foot in the air. I know I'm only light anyway, but still, if I get my weight right, I, I yeah, I'm still quite heavy on top, but yeah. Yeah, you get, you I th- get lads like that. And I think as well, Gav, you as you get older, often you you know your 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 mind is writing checks your body can't cash, right? You think you still can do what you, you did twenty years ago and you know you just ha- you can't. You have to accept that your body's changing and you have to change how you how you approach things. Yeah. Well this is why on uh season one I wanna cover a lot of how we can, because this is going to affect me the next 15, 20, 30 years, how I'm going to be able to train for longevity. So obviously you're you're going through it now um, where you want to get the best out of your training for the next 10, 15, 20 years that you're going to be on the mats. I've already spoke to John Idol about this um, because I it's what I enjoy. I just like being on the mats. I don't want to be broken. Now there's certain things there that I can I can deal with there, like, yeah, make sure you tap, make sure you do this, make sure you do that. However, from an overall longevity standpoint, we need to look at, like, nutrition. We need to look at, like, keeping yourself as fit as possible. We need to look at um, how we can train in a controlled environment, environment, getting the best out of people and not injuring people. Because when you look back to, like, <clears throat> if you go back to, like, the 1980s, right, or when when I first started training, right, uh, in the early 90s, you used to put people on your back and you do squats with them on your back. I suppose you remember it yourself, yeah? You you would never teach or coach that now, okay? You would never coach it. If you go back and watch Kimura on YouTube and watch his videos, how they were warming up and how they were tripped, but this is before they even sparred. You know, they were, they were locking the legs over the shoulders and then doing sit-ups up the backs, you know, all them exercises, which they breeded toughness and conditioning. However, were they the best exercises to do for what we were trying to achieve? That's the question. They they probably achieved a short-term goal. Yes. But um, in terms of longevity, you know, uh, you know, competitive careers are quite short, right? It's yeah. In the fighting arts, they're pretty yeah. short because they're so tough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, I think it's something I look at. Just on the on the topic of longevity, something I've taken from the judo clubs I'm training at. If we're doing sessions that require a lot of throwing, or you're in a lineup doing lots of throws, typically we get the crash mat out. Right. So if you if you're taking a lot of throws on the on a regular mat, it can be quite tough. Yeah. But using the crash mat just takes that impact away. Uh, mm. So that's that's a practice I've adopted from from training with with the judo guys. Is actually we don't have to undergo that repeated impact. Yeah, yeah. But, because in a in a contest, Gareth, you get thrown once. That's it's it. Right? That. You've lost. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you? Because I can't remember off the top of my head. Did you ever come down a plasmatic to train? No. No. So a plasmatic, like I said, you had the stage, which, and then you had the understage. And the understage, we used to have the thin, like, mats, which used to Velcro together. And then we we were on the stage originally, which was a sprung floor, which was great to land on. But when you went under the stage, it was a solid concrete floor. And the difference is, you, it, was, it was night and day. Uh, I want to talk about um, how we met and how we've bonded and how we've, like, you know, become really good friends. and and so. I'll let you run with that if you want to discuss that. Okay. I think the first time we met Gav was there was a course in Ellesmere Port for competition uh, aspects, and you were delivering a ground fighting aspect of that. I think that's, and I think Phil Rhodes was bringing you into the, yeah, into the, the scene to do that type of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, it was it was just a real eye opener, actually. You yeah. know, getting involved in the grappling with you there, and that's gone back. You know, that must have been twenty. I think maybe you just joined the RAF, or you were joining the RAF. Maybe it was just before you joined the RAF. Yeah, I think it probably you, about two thousand and thirteen. That would have been. Right. If I remember correctly, around there, it's ten yeah. years ago. So that was the first time I met you, Gav, and then, yeah. um, over time you'd come to the HQ and do ground fighting courses. Yeah. yeah. And as soon as when you were coming, you know, I was always on those courses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and just developing. And I think we shared the same kind of perspective and philosophy in many ways about uh, martial arts and fighting. Um, and so we just kept in touch. You know, when, when you went to Cyprus, we kept in touch. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I would, you know, often pick your brains about certain things. So we were on the phone, you know, fairly regularly. Weekly. But still yeah. are, you know, weekly, yeah. pretty yeah, much. Yeah. Um, just talking about techniques, um, things that we're trying to do at the club. And, you know, you, you started to help us a lot with developing the, the guys at the club in terms of grappling, um, which everyone, you know, I, I really appreciate and everyone does. And I think it's a, uh, it's, it's been a kind of game changer for us in terms of going forward. It's opened another door mm. in a way we can develop, uh, develop really good skills. And it's, uh, yeah. you know, we're still, we're still at the beginning of that journey. Uh, it, it's, mate, it's a, it's a long journey. You know, uh, I, I think what, what you've achieved the last 18 months, two years has, has been really, really good. You know, you're coming on nicely. Uh, you're not the only one. There's other people that are, looking at it you know like john idol but but john yeah. john's been able to spend a good three four years with me in cyprus as well working on stuff uh we were in the garage quite a bit and then we were obviously at hodge quite a bit so you know john's john's had some good good school in there because he's also had costantinos with him so if i was working or whatever he'd be able to get a hodge and he'd be with costantinos so what you and john have done the last two years has been really good and when you're rolling mate i can see it how much you're yeah, improving. Yeah, I mean, that's good to hear. I mean, we're putting a lot of work in. And, you know, a shout out to John because, you know, I'm 47 and I'm, you know, it's physically, it's it's demanding. You have to adapt, as, yeah. as we mentioned. And John's got that extra bit of age and he's developing. So it's, yeah, you know, he's, a, he's quite a good example, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then what I want to ask you is when you started rolling regular and for example like you roll with me at 60 i'm 60 kilo right 
what are your what's your thought process thinking he's 60 kilo he shouldn't be doing that to me what's what's going on in your mind there because this this inspires a lot of people or it actually t- sends people home and people people's heads go yeah. over it but i had i had a chap in south morton the other day lovely chap he's just started right white belt he brings his wife down as well and we were doing some positional stuff i split his guard and I was on half guard top and I just put the weight down. I got a gable grip on the far shoulder. So I'd like, I had a bit of a cross face, but I wasn't putting the cross face in because I didn't want to hurt him. And I just put the weight down and he's got to be about 95 kilo. And at the end of the roll, he got up and he goes, you don't realize how strong you are. And I'm like, listen, mate, I never lift a weight. I don't lift weights. I said, it's just working on technique. So that thing, that that type of thing can like inspire people a little bit. It's like, well, that that was like really cool how he at five foot six and sixty kilo can do that. Now, don't get me wrong, I've come across people who are hundred kilo that can do that ten times better than me. But what's your thought process there, Dave? And what are you thinking when 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 you get not 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 defeated by movements, but defeated by positioning? Yeah, well, okay. Well, to answer the first part of that, yeah, yeah, we'd been I'd been training quite hard for a while, and the, you know, at my club, the big guys, tough guys, yeah, yeah. and um, rolling with them would develop, and you, we knew you were coming up to yeah. the club, and I thought, right, I've been working really hard on this, I've been moving big guys, I'm rolling with big guys all the time, I'm feeling good, I have 60 kilos. I'm going to have a good go, right? And I thought, naively, I thought I might be able to catch you with something. And the problem was, whenever I tried to apply pressure, it felt like you were just a step. You'd already anticipated what I was going to do, and you adjusted your position. So I struggled then to apply my weight advantage. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't use my weight. Yeah, and um, you know, and I think that's you know, it's a great skill, right? You've been, and to be fair, you've been doing it a long time. You, you yeah. do it to a very high level, um, but it's it's really interesting to see that you're kind of uh, or to try and understand your thought processes and how you're navigating bigger opponents. And I guess that when you turn up to a club, sixty kilos you're probably almost always the lightest guy in a session, right? Yeah, yeah. So navigating people try to use their weight is something you've just, you've done for ever. Mm. But yeah, it just, it, it was an eye opener that, that there are levels. There are levels to this game. And it's the, it's the same, and you know, and they're all kind of grappling based arts, isn't it? They're, the levels just keep, seem to just oh, yeah. keep going. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's evolved. I think it's evolving now. Well, especially the last 15 years where I've had, see, I feel like I'm very blessed and very lucky because I feel that I hit teenage years when this was taking, you know, this was really evolving and taking off. You know what I mean? If I, if I would have hit this like in the eighties or in the seventies, it, it, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and the grappling, it wasn't out there like it is today between between some of the great instructors we've got in the country, some of the great coaches, and obviously the internet, you can go to practically a school in any of the cities now, and sometimes in some of the towns, and you can get high-level black belt coaching. 20 years ago, that did not exist at all. You, I think, don't quote me on it, but I think when Mauricio came over, I think Braulio was a brown belt, and I think Hodger was a brown belt, and I think there might have only been one black belt here. And then obviously Mauricio came over and then Hodger and Braulio had their blacks and everything and it started stemming from there. But you're not talk you're not talking a long, long time ago, only 20 years ago. So and obviously they're the best in the world. So <clears throat> um no, I think I think it's interesting because you wanna you want to inspire people. You want you want people to think, do you know something? That that was good. I, I rule with Kev Capel on uh Thursday. And he's probably the same weight as me now. He's dropped quite a bit of weight. 
And it was just whoever made the first mistake. And I made a mistake. He got a pocket grip. He got the two points. And he wins. You know what I mean? It, 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 it was like, it was that like competitive, but it was, it was a good competitive. It was, it was a fast pace. It was, it was everything that jujitsu like should be about good fun, being with your mate and everything. And like at the end, I was like, you want to know there, you, you got that sweep is beautiful, Kev. And he was like, yeah, you know what I mean? But it's about developing, isn't it? What I find with the bigger guys is, is that I can't allow them to get the grips. They start getting the grips and they know what they're doing, especially once they start getting to like a, I've had a couple of blue belts who are, are an absolute nightmare. And in BJJ, I find the blue belt is like the biggest gulf. You can have blue belts and you think, hmm, how are they a blue belt type of thing? You know what I mean? They, they've done well getting a blue belt. And then you'll have other blue belts and you'll think, you're not a blue belt. Do you know what I mean? Your movements, your pace, everything you bring is absolutely really, really high level. But they could be a high level comp, you know, comp competition blue belt so i find that with the bigger guys when they get the grips and they know what they're doing they will start slowly positioning themselves and breaking me down from there so they'll split the guard they'll pass the guard and then and then once they pass the guard mate it's 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 hard it's so hard when they're good you know but i'll come home i'll think about it I'll reflect on it i'll think right tomorrow night what can i work on So what I want to do, I want to talk about briefly your writing and that journal that you sent me two weeks last Saturday, which I read and was blown away by. So let's just talk briefly about that and what we could take from that from an actual sporting point of view. Okay. So... Okay, well, I've, I've written a couple of articles on the origins of jiu-jitsu in the UK and of various uh, kind of fighting techniques or methods. The article I sent you isn't out yet. It will be coming out of the Journal of Martial Arts Studies, which is edited by Paul Bowman, who's a, a professor of cultural history in Cardiff. He's going to come on the podcast, actually, and talk to us. Um, and the article was about uh, an organization called the British Jiu-Jitsu Society. And this was a, an, op, uh, an organization that was in operation between 1925 and, and the early 1930s. And it was really, it came about because I, um, I got hold of some documents. Basically, there were eight syllabus booklets of this British Jiu-Jitsu Society. And um, a, a lady had found these in her grandfather's loft when she was cleaning it out and had sent them to me and they were really interesting actually and I through studying these I was able to see okay what kind of techniques were they doing how did it compare to the literature that had been published and how did it compare to the, the techniques that were being practiced in the Budokai uh, judo schools yeah. that were present at the same time and, and through studying this we were able to get a perspective on, on a number of things. The jiu-jitsu that was brought to the UK by Yuki Otani, Sarakazu Yaneshi, uh, and that they wrote in their books, they, they weren't Kodokan Judoka, but they obviously had, you know, they either had a, a knowledge of, of, of judo or the judo, the jiu-jitsu styles they were practicing were very similar, had common competitive elements. But I was able to see how the techniques they had brought over and the terminologies used developed into what the British Jiu-Jitsu Society were using, which was pretty much, it was quite different. So come, you know, Tani and Yaneshi arrived in 1900. By 1925, the British Jiu-Jitsu Society is running. Um, but pretty much it's all judo. Mm. It's pretty much all judo. And it's... Um, in that time, judo and jiu-jitsu were used interchangeably. And judo was just considered a modern style of jiu-jitsu, which it, it was. Um, 
and it was really an analysis of that technical development, how the jiu-jitsu had changed. And bear in mind, we had, you know, the First World War. Yeah. Where a lot of people who would have been teaching jiu-jitsu or practicing it had gone, some, many of whom not come back. Um, and so it was just the kind of, a kind of evolution on how jiu-jitsu was reinventing itself through, the, through that period. Um, in terms of development or what we can learn, if you look at the early jiu-jitsu text, Gav, uh, a book I've talked to you about, The Game of Jiu-Jitsu, which was by Tani mm -hmm. and Miyaki. It's a terrific book. And if you look at the tech in there and the advice, it's almost, it could have been written. It could have been written this year. It's yeah. as relevant almost, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in terms of, and there's a, there's a huge amount of literature out there, but in terms of how we've developed, you could look at these some of these early books and say, yeah, there has been development and evolution of techniques and practice, you know, performance, and that's changed. The professionalism's changed it, but technically, there's a lot of stuff that that worked, and because of the stuff evolved in Japan over hundreds of years, right? So yeah, yeah, it was already highly developed. Yeah, I've been really enjoying this book that you you gave me. Oh yeah, yeah. It's about, yeah, terrific. Yeah. Uh, it's it's unbelievable. The unstold the the untold story of jiu-jitsu in Brazil, volume two, 1950 to 1960. It's about when Elio Gracie fought Camorra and uh, it's amazing. Like so I, I I've got about a quarter of the book left to read, but yeah, a lot of interesting stuff there. But they're terrific books, and just when you read those books, and if you read um Richard Bowen's Hundred Years of Judo in Great Britain. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of parallels you can draw between the development of judo and jiu jitsu in the UK and in Brazil. A yeah. lot of the kind of you know, so Maeda who went to Brazil to, you know, he was a Kodokan judo player. Yeah, he took um, y Yuneshi, who'd been in the UK for a period of years. He was part of Maeda's troop mm. at that early phase in Brazil. So people were learning the same thing, and there were a lot of contest between jiu-jitsu versus wrestling versus boxing in brazil you also had the capoeira contest yeah to see what was the best fighting style so the development early on was very very similar yeah. and i think just you know in judo uh, as a global kind of sport took over certainly in the uk judo became more dominant from you know the 1930s on uh, and it, obviously judo was a big thing in brazil as well yeah, but I think I think the Gracies just managed to keep hold of it more in Brazil and develop their unique uh, kind of take on on Jiu Jitsu. Yeah, yeah. I think because of the internet not existing, people did travel back then, but they didn't travel as much. Unless you were going to Brazil, you weren't exposed to what the Gracies were doing in 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 Brazil until probably like the the eighties, late seventies, early eighties, when Horion came to the United States. Um, obviously, everyone got exposed to it. UFC one nineteen ninety three, but yeah, unless unless you went to Brazil to Rio, you did you didn't really get exposed to it. And how many people would go to Rio on holiday back in the nineteen forties, nineteen fifties? You know, I think people used to go Blackpool yeah. then for their holidays. Yeah. So what we're going to do, we're going to bring the first uh, episode to a close. I don't know. We probably talked for about 15 hours there, haven't we? And we haven't even touched, you know, touched the tip of the iceberg. Like, um, so we're going to bring the first episode to a close and then we're going to come back with episode two. We're going to discuss some other topics. Um, thanks for your time, Dave. Anything b before we finish, before we come to a close, anything you just want to add on to what we've already discussed? No, thanks, Gav. It's been a pleasure talking to you as always and uh, look forward to episode two. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, mate. Cheers. Talk soon. Bye-bye.